Our second reading is from the Gospel according to Luke. We're reading from chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. If you'd like to follow along, you can find it beginning on page 56 in the back section of your Red Pew Bible. And we'll be looking at various Advent stories, sort of the stories that come before the Christmas story. Some might be familiar to you, some might be new to you. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. In the days of King Herod of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God, and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now, at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, He will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Now, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people." Gracious God, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that are open to receive and respond to your message, your word to us this day. Amen. Now, as I look around, I know that we are a growing and a diverse congregation. We come from different backgrounds, different interests, different traditions, But there is one thing we all have in common, and it's actually not our love of nature or skiing, although it is related to skiing in a way. Here it is. This is what we all have in common. You ready for it? None of us like to wait. I don't think, right? I mean, if you like to wait, raise your hand, and we'll have a conversation afterwards. I'll do some pastoral counseling. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait in lines at the grocery store. We don't like to wait in lines at the mountain, like on the quad or the Gandhi. None of us like to wait in those lines. In fact, we have apps now on our phone that tell us how long that you can expect to wait in line to go up the mountain. And depending on the wait, if it's 15 minutes here or two minutes here, I'm like, I'm doing the bunny slope. 
because I don't want to wait in line. We don't like to wait in traffic, and we all experienced that this fall. Wasn't that a delight? We don't like to wait for children to listen to us. We think, how long will this last? But there are other things that we don't like to wait for. Sometimes we don't like to wait for other people to change. Or, more personally, waiting for test results to come back from the doctor. There are times that we put ourselves in situations, we find ourselves and, and we, we want the answers, we want to know what the results, what the future will look like, but we don't. We have to wait. And for a culture that is fast-paced, on the go, 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 we actually spend a lot of time waiting. And very often, much of it is out of our control, out of our hands. And we don't like that very often. But what if, in our waiting... There was a time of growth for us. What if sometimes God shows up in powerful and profound ways as we wait? Sometimes we are waiting for an answer from God. At different times and different seasons in our lives, we have all struggled with unanswered prayer. And perhaps we have all lived with the longing of unmet desires whatever they might be for you. Perhaps we are waiting patiently to meet a life partner or to have that long-desired first child. Perhaps we are waiting for vocational clarity that would allow us to use our God-given talents and passion. Perhaps we are waiting for enough financial resources to go back to school or to meet the pressing needs of our family or to enjoy the life that we've always dreamed of. Whatever it is, and maybe now, in this stage and season of life, you find yourself waiting. And when this happens, it is normal and expected at times for feelings of frustration, or defeat, or disappointment to enter our spirits. We might say, how long? How long must I wait? When we think about Advent, often we think about preparations for Christmas. And we're all supposed to be in good cheer, right? Put the big smile on. And then we realize, oh, this is a very stressful time. This is not what it's supposed to be. This is not what Hallmark says it's supposed to feel like. But, you know, we anticipate the birth of the Christ child. We remember God's love for us. And it's the, those, those, all those good feels, right? And those times will come. But we also have to wait for those. And Advent is an intentional time of preparing our hearts and entering into this season of longing and uncertainty and at times doubt. That's okay. We are together as one community to enter into that. If we pay attention to the many stories within the Advent narrative, like the one we just read, we find that there is space even for lamentation. The, the psalm that, that Dave read, Psalm 25, is really a psalm of mourning, of lamenting to God, of being honest and open and vulnerable with what's going on inside of our hearts. And that is okay. In, in fact, sometimes that is really important. And it's good this season, as we're beginning Advent, to say, yeah, we can lean into that. Because maybe that's where we are right now. Maybe it doesn't feel like Christmas It feels like something else. And that is okay. Because if that's how you feel, you are entering into the the story of women and men in Scripture. And you're entering truly into the Advent narrative. Lamentation is okay. In fact, every year we hold a special service here in the sanctuary called Blue Christmas. For those for whom this season is difficult. This season is painful. It brings back hard memories from the pain of loss of loved ones or from childhood. And we actually enter into that. We acknowledge it. And together as one community, we offer prayers and sing songs and have a message of healing and hope as well. 
And in its own way, lamenting is an act of faith, actually. Because it speaks to our understanding that things are not as they should be in our own lives, in our families, with our health, in our communities, and in the wider world. And sometimes, coming from the Thanksgiving holiday weekend, you realize things are not as they should be, right? With our families. Well, you can lament that. And that is an act of faith, actually. Because we realize that we have longings of of how things can be, how things should be. So to cry out for help, to acknowledge the disappointment and the challenge of our situations is actually an act of waiting faithfully with unanswered prayer. Because you can have unanswered prayer and just give up. Like, I'm done. I'm checked out. And that's understandable too. But to continue to pray, to continue to acknowledge your situation, and to wait faithfully with anticipation that something will happen. The night will end, the dawn will come, light will shine in the darkness. This is the meaning of Advent. And during these moments or these seasons of our lives, we can express a deep faith by continuing to speak to God, continuing to speak to one another with honesty and transparency and vulnerability about the things in our lives and the things in the world that are not as they should be. Sometimes it's really important and healthy to acknowledge that, not to pretend it doesn't exist. And so we first meet Zechariah and Elizabeth in the midst of a, apparently a very long season, very long season of disappointment and unanswered prayer. They had been praying for years, decades perhaps, for a child. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, praying for something that they longed for in their heart. And maybe this morning you find yourself in that situation, maybe not for a child, but for something else or for someone else. But they continued to show up. They continued to gather. They continued to receive the support of the community around them. Remember, we read when Zechariah went into the sanctuary, the whole assembly gathered around and prayed. Maybe they prayed for him. Maybe they prayed for Elizabeth. Well, in this particular story, which in some ways does resemble a more well-known story of the angel, Gabriel, showing up to another woman named Mary, who was Elizabeth's cousin, by the way. Well, we read in this story that their prayers were heard, that God had not forgotten them. They were remembered by God. And the angel Gabriel reveals himself to Zechariah while Zechariah is doing what he was supposed to be doing, which I think is really important. Our responsibilities and our commitments do not stop while we lament, while we hope, while we pray, while we wait. Who knows how God will meet us when we least expect it and in the very place that we are meant to be. And in fact, Zachariah and Elizabeth received so much more than they asked for or could have ever imagined. And who their son John was going to be. John the Baptist. I remember back about 12 years ago. My wife Loretta and I were were hoping and praying to start a family. In fact, we had been married a few years. And we were in the dreaming phase of owning our first home. Starting a family. And making roots. we, We thought in Westchester County in New York. Yet none of those dreams were coming to fruition, not a one, for a number of years. And in fact, the doors that we were trying to open up ourselves for home, for job, for family, one by one, they continued to be closed. 
Sometimes they were shut in our face. And it was confusing, it was disappointing, and it was painful, to be quite honest. And in the midst of that time period, while we were really hoping to stay in that area, and this was home for us, this is what we wanted, an opportunity came up, sort of out of the blue, for us to move to Paris. Not what we were hoping for. Not what was in our like, agenda or our plans for our future. But something inside of us, at this season of our life, said, if this is God's leading and God's will, we need to say yes. We have no idea what this is going to look like for our future. And in fact, at the time, saying yes to God seemed like saying no to starting a family. And seemed like saying no to making roots. And seemed like saying no to the future that we, we had envisioned for ourselves. And though very difficult, we were surrounded by a very supportive community of faithful people who prayed with us and prayed for us in the times that we couldn't pray for ourselves. In the times where we had doubts, the faithful came and had faith for us. So we trusted in God's care. We trusted in God's timing. We trusted in God's faithfulness and left everything and everyone behind and headed to a country whose language we did not speak with a whole bunch of unanswered prayers and many, many questions and concerns filling our suitcases. And I remember that first Advent. I remember going to the Notre Dame Cathedral and lighting a candle in the very front and offering prayers for my wife, Loretta, offering prayers for myself. I felt sort of lost and confused and unsure. And I remember surrendering our future into God's hands. I said, this is not our life. God, it's your life for us. Your will be done. Advent really hit home for me that year. I really understood what it was like to wait with unanswered prayer. In fact, some of the stories of the scriptures really hit home to us personally as we were longing for children and didn't have them. I understood unmet desires, deep longing, and what it felt like to live in the tension of faith, holding on to faith and unanswered prayer. And in that moment in Notre Dame, like Zachariah's prayer, I watched the smoke of the candle that I lit, similar to one of these candles. I watched the flame flicker, which sort of felt like my faith, but I saw the smoke rising up through the dome and the beautiful ceilings, the rose stained glass window. And I felt and hoped that we were being remembered by God. One year later, on December 14th, 2012, we welcomed Jack and Blake Haug into the world and into our hearts. And I have a photo of myself that Christmas Eve, coming back at like 11.30 or midnight from one of our services, with this robe from my mentor, Scott, and I still haven't returned it to him, and a stole, a white stole that said joy. And I held and cradled my twin boys in the palms of both of my hands as they were weeks old. And there's a photo that I will always cherish. That Christmas meant so much to me because of the advent I had experienced the year before. And so friends, I encourage and remind us all that advent is a season in which we are meant to be reminded that God does remember us always. That God invites us to listen, to dwell, 
to wait, to trust, and to hope. Never give up on hope. And we can do this with one another. In fact, we need one another. As Desmond Tutu once said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. So as we enter into this Advent season, we join with faithful women and men of Scripture who waited upon God to answer their prayers and to keep God's promises of salvation, of freedom from injustice and oppression, for hope, for new beginnings, for new life. May we take time in the weeks ahead to walk alongside women and men like Elizabeth and Zachariah and Mary and Joseph who were open and available to experience these divine and intimate encounters with God that at times startled them into silence and inspired them to praise and thanksgiving. This Advent, my prayer for us all, that we may rejoice in what the Lord has done for us. And like Elizabeth, may God look favorably upon us all. Now and always. Amen.